Philadelphia move bombing, Tulsa, uh, which is like literally still called the, the race riots. For words like territory. territory or commonwealth. These are places where people are subject to U.S. rule, but don't enjoy the full rights that other Americans do. I want to tell you about one of them, Puerto Rico. When you're in Puerto Rico, you're not just in a vacation paradise. You are in a part of the United States. It feels like the United States, but it also feels distinctly different. This feeling, this limbo state, didn't happen by accident. In fact, it's perhaps the best example of the lengths the United States has gone to hold on to land. So let me show you how the U.S. kept their colony in the Caribbean, using brute force, spying, and the abuse of land and people. This is how the U.S. stole Puerto Rico. Pause the video really quick. Um, I need to. Oh just damn! He's changed up his fit, dude. Oh shit! He changed up his fit. He's got that like I'm in the jungle. He's got that I'm in the jungle colonizing fit on, dude. Yo! Tell you something, which is that about three years ago, I started seeing a therapist because I was kind of not in a happy place. Oh my god! Better help. Once you're connected to phone and sleep with a lot of these Spanish empire looks like this this video and now let's dive back into Puerto Rico okay so it's 1898 and the Spanish empire looks like this but it's faltering a lot of its colonies are fighting for independence the United States gets involved and allies with a lot of these independence fighters they say they want to liberate these colonies and so they get into the war and they win. But instead of liberating Spain's colonies, they just take them for themselves. And one of those colonies was Puerto Rico. And so on an ordinary Tuesday in the late 1800s, there was a quiet ceremony that takes place on the governor's balcony in San Juan. After 400 years of Spanish rule, Puerto Rico, this island in the Caribbean, is simply passed from one ruler to the next. And this begins an unprecedented experiment in the Caribbean for the United States, an operation to extract resources, money, labor, and military protection from this small, beautiful island. They start by passing a law I gotta pee. that gives the US total political control over the island. They start appointing American leaders to govern the island, men who don't speak Spanish, don't know anything about Puerto Rico or its people. Most of these leaders treat the assignment like a business venture. Like this one guy who, when he was the leader of Puerto Rico, starts to give public Puerto Rican funds to American-owned businesses on the island. Then he stacks the government with American loyalists. And then eventually he resigns, but then he returns to the island to build a sugar kingdom. Now with the help of all of the political officials that he had appointed, this company balloons into the largest global sugar business on earth. And when it's domino, you're sure it's pure. At the same time, US banks descend on the island, giving out very predatory loans and then foreclosing on land, gobbling it up and turning it into, you guessed it, sugar farms. Puerto Rico is slowly turning into a sugar island and becoming more and more dependent on shipments from the mainland. The US enacts a new policy that says that anything going into Puerto Rico has to be transported by American ships with American crews. So of course this skyrockets the prices for locals, which is made worse by the fact that the US government had devalued and then outlawed the local currency. So now every Puerto Rican lost almost half of their wealth overnight. And as a part of this push to lock Puerto Rico in as their colony, they forbid Spanish in schools and public institutions. And so in this very short amount of time, the US turned Spain's former colony into this giant sugar farm, stripping down local identity and language and culture in the process and locking the people under their control. And then Congress gives Puerto Ricans U.S. citizenship, which conveniently was just in time for a giant global war. So Puerto Rican men got sent to the front lines to fight for the country that was in the process of pillaging their island. By 1922, a series of Supreme Court cases had solidified Puerto Rico as a, quote, unincorporated territory, which is just like word salad for the U.S. Constitution doesn't fully apply here. I mean, think about it. Unincorporated territory. This intentionally contradictory jargon. I don't get it. Capitalism is so great. So why not super capitalism in Puerto Rico? Just like more capitalism. 
and that came from these men hundreds of miles away. But honestly, the message was very clear. Puerto Ricans did not look or sound enough like Americans to actually be a part of the United States. By the 1930s, big banks owned 60% of these sugar farms, 80% of the tobacco farms, and 100% of the... Puerto Ricans still get ads at the top of the hour, too, because it's technically still U.S. territory. You know what I mean? Which you can avoid for $5 or for free with a Twitch Prime by connecting your Amazon Prime account to your Twitch account if you no longer want to see those ads at the top of the fucking hour. Guam, too. Yeah. Puerto Rican vegan socialist will not be seeing those ads because he is subscribed. Disgusting exploitative segue. Yeah. Anyway, um, Wizard called. Thank you for the five tier one gift to subs, allowing five people, five Puerto Ricans to no longer see the ads at the top of the hour. Here's the three minute ad break now. Railroads and shipping facilities. At the same time, Puerto Ricans were being paid less than four cents an hour. If you put that into today's currency by inflation, that's like a dollar an hour. Poverty and malnutrition start to grip this island. All the while, the U.S. is turning the island into an essential military outpost. See how Puerto Rico juts out a little bit into the Caribbean? It served as a strategically positioned island to help protect trade routes and a place where you could refuel ships. Over time, more and more military bases and installations start to pop up on this island. The U.S. would go on to test thousands of bombs in Puerto Rico, leaving behind one of the most hazardous waste sites in the United States. And by the middle of the 1900s, Puerto Rico really starts to mirror what the U.S. Envisioned. Puerto Rico, the sugar metropolis. Puerto Rico, the land of low wages and abundant laborers. Puerto Rico, the irreplaceable military outpost. The empire that built themselves as the liberators from Spain is now an overlord, and the locals start fighting back. The fight is led by this guy, Pedro Albizu Campos. He's this poor kid who ends up going to Harvard. He graduates valedictorian from Harvard Law School. He serves the US in World War I and even helps draft Ireland's independence constitution. Like the guy's kind of a superstar. Ultimately, he returns to his hometown to attempt the impossible, Puerto Rican independence. But soon, Campos would find himself bouncing in and out of prison for 25 years. Cuando los adultos de la patria tienen que ser salir despavoridos de sus lares, no tienen siquiera salida a países extranjeros distintos del poder enemigo que nos oculta. Tienen que ir a Estados Unidos a ser los esclavos de los poderes económicos de los tiranos de nuestra patria. Things haven't quite escalated. This movement is just starting. Campos comes back to Puerto Rico with the goal of total separation from the United States. And people join him. A lot of people. Just everyday, ordinary Puerto Ricans who are fed up with being exploited. They join them, they organize, and they call themselves the Nationalists. They run for office, they go on strike, and they fight back against this superpower that has been exploiting them. Momentum begins to pick up. And then the dominoes really start to fall. There was this American doctor. His name is Cornelius Rhodes, and he went to Puerto Rico saying he's gonna do like health research or something. We know what he really was doing and thinking because he wrote this letter. Let me read it to you. He writes that Puerto Ricans are, quote, beyond doubt, the dirtiest, laziest, and most degenerate and thievish race of men ever to have inhabited this sphere. And he goes on to say that it makes him sick to, quote, inhabit the same island with them. But he doesn't stop there. He says that Puerto Ricans Least racist American military official, dude. Least racist colonizer. Um, I know a lot of people hear nationalism and immediately go, whoa, 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 nationalism. Why I have often talked about nationalism as an emancipatory cause against uh, colonial powers, okay? Puerto Rico's mistake, I guess, is that they went against the United States of America and they did it like a hundred years after these nationalist movements created 
in the post uh, colony world, uh, actual fucking nation states. Okay. It's about forming a national identity and creating a nation state. Nationalism, nationalism of the oppressed is different from nationalism of the oppressor. A lot of people that only learn about politics online hear nationalism and don't comprehend it, don't understand it. Okay? Like, for example, pan-African nationalism. They hear that online and they think, what? That's like, these guys are the same as white nationalists, I think. No, that's not the same. It is, it is a movement to create a national identity. Irish nationalism is a movement to create uh, or a movement uh, towards full emancipation from colonial subjugation. <sighs> anyway, just something important to explain to people. Indian nationalism uh as an emancipatory movement against England and British colonial violence is different than Indian nationalism now because India is a nation state now. Okay. need quote something to totally exterminate the entire population and then he admits to a crime he says i have done my best to further the process of their extermination by killing off eight and transplanting cancer into several more i mean this is bad this is it's really bad but for a lot of puerto ricans this wasn't surprising. So the staff at the hospital find this letter and they send it around to everyone and it <sighs> goes out and it goes Bad. viral. And nothing happens to this guy who has admitted to murdering a bunch of Puerto Ricans. Actually, something does happen. He gets uh, on the front cover of Time Magazine. Brilliant. Dude, Time Magazine has an incredible track record with this, by the way. You know, other notable figures that made it to the cover of Time Magazine, Adolf fucking Hitler. To the nationalists, this letter confirms something that they already knew. It actually wasn't that surprising. There was an awareness that, yes, America loves Puerto Rico for their soil and their labor and their strategic location, but hates them as people. So after this letter, the movement explodes. It's crazy for Johnny. This whole thing is somehow different for Cuba. Um, what has he done about Cuban independence? I don't think he, I don't think he would say the opposite for Cuba. I guess maybe. I don't know. Have I watched any of his Cuban videos? Has he has he done videos on Cuba? Oof! Bad look, Adolf Hitler. Oof! Bad move. Yeah, big oof. He's critical of Batista and Castro? What? No, we watched a video on Cuba that wasn't directly related to the Cuban Revolution. It was more so about, like, America's involvement after. So it's different. I'm talking like straight up one where he like talks about the 
It gets to the point where the US and their puppet government on the island can no longer ignore this movement. Soon, a bunch of new officers are hired and trained and armed with machine guns and tear gas. But the nationalists keep fighting. Then in 1935, police kill four nationalists at a university event. The nationalists retaliate by killing the police chief. Then, without trial, the police execute his killer and arrest Campos, the leader of the movement, for plotting to overthrow the government. Campos is given this rigged trial with a jury made up mostly of mainland Americans, and he gets sentenced to prison for 10 years. A few months later, people are out peacefully protesting on Palm Sunday, and the police start shooting into the crowd. Men, women, children, and elders are all clubbed and beaten to death and shot in the back as they run away. 19 good American, wholesome American stuff are killed, and over 100 are wounded, but it still doesn't put down the movement. The violence only pours fuel on the fire. Back in Washington, D.C., they're starting to get worried that this independence movement is just going to keep building. And they don't want to give up their island in the Caribbean. There's still plenty of money to be made off of Puerto Rican soil and labor, not to mention the military bases that they had there. So they turn to an extreme measure, something that, as I learned about and as we reported on, has been blowing my mind in a way that I, you know, I study this stuff a lot. I look at the behavior of empires. I look at how they control people. I've never seen this before. It starts with FBI agents who come to the island to work with the police of Puerto Rico. They have one simple mission to spy on. This is still not defeating the CIA allegations because technically given Puerto Rico's territorial status, uh, it's it's the CIA shitting on the FBI. You know what I mean? Typical typical CIA behavior, just criticizing the FBI and being like, those guys are bad. Not us, though. Anyone who they deem politically subversive and to sabotage them and thus sabotage the independence movement. So they spy on everyone. They spy on the nationalists who are part of the movement, but also their friends, their partners, their sexual partners, their business colleagues, their children. They track down criminal records and mistresses and debtors and creditors and photos. God, so odd that the FBI does this. Surely they never did this during the civil rights movement. I mean, I mean, certainly, no. That that can't be a thing that they... Please don't tell me that they did this also to Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and the like. No. And license plate numbers, school transcripts, and even the guest list to weddings. Like, they got really, really detailed. They started listening in on phone calls and intercepting letters. Everything was fair game. The idea was to create Panopticon, this idea that they're always watching. They also started to cultivate relationships with a network of informers. Often the victim's family or friends or neighbors would get sucked into this state spying apparatus. The FBI uses payments and coercion and manipulation, which often forces people to turn on each other, causing divorce and broken friendship and fractured communities. Much of this was done undercover, like these FBI agents would just be dressed in normal clothes, but would be constantly surveilling the people around them. Oh, and we know about this because they documented everything. I've, I've often talked about this, but like the state security apparatus oftentimes will do this thing 20, 30 years or even sometimes 10 years after the fact where they will go and declassify all of the shit that they did. And it's more so like a big flex. But of course, you look at that and go, oh, well, time has passed. We know that was wrong. And they certainly aren't doing that now. Only to be shocked 10, 20, 30 years down the line again. When, it, when you find out that, no, they have consistently continued doing the same shit. Uh, and that everyone who said, oh, no, that's not happening anywhere uh, right now. Uh, all the people that were saying, no, Hassan, you're a fucking conspiracy theorist for this. Uh, well, you're, you're in the wrong, only to find out that they are always in the wrong. A 
If you were a person of interest, you probably had a file. All of these files, they're called the carpetas. Our story producer, Rafaela, went to San Juan to see the carpetas firsthand. So I'm at the General Archive building in San Juan in Puerto Rico to see these secret surveillance documents that were collected on thousands of Puerto Ricans over so many decades. After weeks of work, I finally got to look at Las Carpetas to see what was actually in these files. Las and Carpetas. it's kind of creepy, I have to uh -huh. say. You see specific times and dates and details for meetups, detailed descriptions of the locations where people are just meeting, all of the names of people involved, these subgroups that were potentially supporters of the independence movement. You get these highly detailed physical descriptions of the people that they were tracking, their occupation, the model of their car, their license plate number, and all of their moves, all of their activities, what they were doing, who they were According to the research, during the investigation, she participated in the pickets during the strike at the UIA, and she always passed by the members of the FUPI, for which I qualify her a member of this group. Cool. We're supporting. And even for those who moved away from Puerto Rico, they continued to track them, knowing exactly what apartment they lived in in the Bronx. They speculated about their nationalistic tendencies. And then you see these interviews that agents were having with people close to NATO Andes watch this video and go, yeah, this is why nationalism is bad. The FBI was based. <laughs> NATO Andes will be like, the FBI was just fighting against nationalism. What do you mean? Uh, I thought you hated white nationalism. Whoa. All of a sudden it's cool when Puerto Ricans are doing white nationalism. Uh, sorry, Sweeney to the target, where their personal beliefs are revealed, like one who thought that Puerto Rico would be repaired with socialism and independence. You can see a source telling these agents that they're afraid that their friend had become friends with the leaders of the independence movement and had been inducted in because of this friendship. And of course, these informants request that all this information they're spilling to the agents, quote, be kept secret. These agents would even interview family members. Like there's this whole transcript of God, I have such a funny segue here. I'd be like, if my FBI file ever came to me, it would be Hassan serves the top of the hour ad breaks at the top of every hour, but I already did the segue. So unfortunately, I will not be doing another one. But it would have been so fucking good if I timed it perfectly. I ran it already. I'm not running it again. I'm just saying, can I have fun? Stop. Stop giving me a zero out of 10. It would have been a 10 10 if I actually did it like that. no fun allowed dude holy shit of the agents talking to the mother of someone who was suspected to be a part of the independence movement oh yeah and in all of these documents you see an obsession with who had guns it's hard to overstate how exhaustive this spying effort was and how powerful it was the fbi was able to use all of this information to intimidate and blackmail and punish suspected nationalists i mean there are thousands of these examples from children being like kidnapped and put into a helicopter by the fbi to people being denied government jobs all because they had a carpeta at the end of the day it was psychological war against puerto ricans carpeta. who wanted independence and it worked horrifically well in dividing these people and making them feel powerless because they were always being watched in their most personal of moments Oh, and it wasn't just a couple of years. This lasted for decades. Eventually it gets to the point where Campos and the nationalists see no other way other than armed revolution. In the fall of 1950, the nationalists declare Puerto Rico as an independent nation. They attempt to seize towns, to set government buildings on fire, to cut phone lines. They try to assassinate the governor. And let's be honest, it's 1950. Like the United States is easily the most powerful country to have ever existed. These people had no chance of winning against the newly crowned global superpower. Their goal was to bring attention to the world, to pressure the US to give up its colony. But instead, the United States responded by dropping bombs. The only time in the history of the United States where they bombed their own citizens. Nope. No, that's not true. They've definitely done it a lot. Just saying, that isn't correct. That is incorrect. Philadelphia move bombing, Tulsa, uh, which is like literally still called the race riots. Um, that was, it's, uh, yeah, the bombing of Black Wall Street in Tulsa. 
uh, coal miners in Blair Mountain. There's there's a bunch of times when they've done that. So, nine <laughs> eleven. <laughs> Stop. Stop. Okay, I didn't say that. That's crazy. Why would you guys say 9-11 is another time when the United States bombed its own citizens? <laughs> that wasn't a bomb. That was a plane. There's a difference. There's a distinction. One survivor of the revolution. Was Unless you mean Semtex. Unless you mean Semtex. You know what I'm saying? was interviewed five years ago and said that it was a David against Goliath situation and that their leader told them that they might die, but that they might succeed, but that at least they would have let the world know about Puerto Rico. During this revolution, many of the fighters wore their Sunday best, ironed suits and pressed ties because they knew they would die. They had a cause they were fighting for. In the end, two dozen are killed. Puerto Rico really didn't have a chance. President Truman comes out and is sort of like, there was an incident in Puerto Rico, sort of downplays it. And a couple days <laughs> later, two nationalists attempt to assassinate him. The world doesn't come to Puerto Rico's rescue. And instead, the police carry out a mass arrest, throwing 3,000 people in jail. A few years later, four nationalists open fire in the chamber of the US Congress. Campos is arrested again, and this time he's sentenced to 80 years in prison. There's evidence that during this time in prison, Campos was exposed to extreme levels of radiation. The consequences allegedly gave him a stroke and left him paralyzed and unable to speak. Just, in the you end, know, just, uh, just a little bit of gross torture, just straight up. I, it's actually wild that he's talking about this. Uh, I'm, you know. the U.S.'s wish came true. They silenced Campos for good. After the squashing of the revolution, the surveillance program continued for decades. In the end, it was a total of 50 years of state-sanctioned spying on the people of Puerto Rico. When it all came to light, they estimated that around 100,000 people had files. A lot of people in Puerto Rico knew that this was happening, but they just knew it in their gut. They didn't have any real evidence of it. They didn't realize the sheer scale, the methodical approach that the FBI was taking to spy on them and to divide them and to psychologically debase them. In total, it was 1.8 million pages of documentation. And many of the victims of this spying are still alive today. I think the carpetas are a really powerful signal of how the US kept its colony in the Caribbean. They were the cementing of what the US had done from the beginning, which is create a system of reliance and oppression where people lived and died under the thumb of this massive superpower that was exerting very, very aggressive control over these people these people who were American citizens. It's hard to fully understand and impossible to relate to the psychological impact that this program would have on the people that it affected, but also the generations who came from the people who it affected. Imagine such a pervasive force that was sowing division, mistrust, betrayal, and fear, not just of the government, but of each other. Puerto Rico never got independence. And to this day, they remain an unincorporated territory, which means that they don't have the same rights as other American citizens. And the status of the island is a heated debate. Many Puerto Ricans value the modern day benefits of being connected to the US, but at what cost? This yeah, is I mean, they have no power. It's like the worst position possible where they have citizenship, but no actual legislative power. Um, and no pathway towards other people. There's also a, a, a viable and a relatively sizable uh, a group of individuals that want statehood, right? But of course, instead of that, uh, instead of all of that, you get the worst of both worlds, no statehood and no legislative power, no representation, no voice, and simply just the worst aspects of predatory capitalism where Puerto Rico is seen as like a tax haven and a tourist destination for the United States of America where Harris forgets to mention that because of this, the U S went through a mass sterilization campaign in PR and decimated the birth rate of the Island.
Isn't Logan Paul and Dave Porkboy there? No, Logan and Jake uh, are there. I don't think Dave Pork... Dave Porkboy only went to Miami. He, he didn't want to leave uh, the mainland. Which is a very subtle and slight Puerto Rican W. Lady doing back there. Oh, ma'am. Ma'am. Ma'am, what is happening? The independence movement didn't recover until recently, and their candidate in 2024 is finally a real contender. by the U.S.'s lasting control over the island. And even though the people of Puerto Rico served in our armed forces, they still can't Bilid vote for the president. They still don't have full representation in our democracy. And yet, Puerto Rico Bilid still has this immense impact Bilid on American culture and life. Bilid the food, the music, the dance, Bilid the art from this island, it's a part of what it means to be American. And yet, I think most of us don't really think about the status of this place very often, or its history. It's only when there's like a hurricane on this island, and we see the U.S. kind of barely show up relative to how they show up for their other citizens. Only then are we reminded that Puerto Rico is a colonial possession, one taken in war and exploited through predatory and racist policies, and then held on to through a massive amount of state force, you gonna go spying, outside? violence, and repression. And what we're left with is yet another example of a place whose vibrant spirit and culture and people are somehow able to shine through the dark fog of colonial abuse that has left deep wounds on this island. Tough. Great stuff. I mean, it's a pretty decent video by Johnny Harris. I have no notes, honestly. Um... Let's get to, let's, before we get to Tucker Carlson, let's get to our last uh, item on the docket here. On Charlie Kirk's show, 